new way to look at poverty is all about blending mercy and justice. Um, and you, so you have all the slides. Um, basically, we have a, a growing segment of the population is the working poor. And that is not a pejorative term because they work and they're poor. It's a, it's a descriptive term. It shouldn't be. If you work, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be poor to the, to the point where you can't support yourself, but that's where we are right now. A lot of people, it's, it's systemic poverty that causes it, and um, it's not their fault, but they get blamed. A lot of people put the blame on them, put the responsibility. Why don't they just get more jobs? Why don't they work harder? Whatever. Um, <laughs>
keep them alive. Um, we kind of still sort of think about charity in, in that way. We kind of infantilize people who need help. Not the orphans, they really were. Some of them really were infants, but who widows, immigrants, disabled, and elderly, just because you're disabled doesn't mean you can't earn a living. And, but yeah, we still kind of tend to, to um, sort of patronize them. Um, because God's people were meant to take care of them, it says so in Isaiah. Well, that's not exactly what Isaiah meant. Um, but we'll, so we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But remember, they had no social power, meaning they were not able-bodied men who lived in that land. Those were the guys who made all of this. Everybody else was at the mercy of them, pretty much. And then in the New Testament, this is probably one of the most quoted um, lines from the, from the Bible. One of the most taken out of context and one of the most misused. For you, this is Jesus talking, you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. Just taken out of context like that, it makes it sound like poverty is inevitable. Okay, there's nothing we can do about it. It's part of the world. Just the way it is. Um, but this comes from a larger story that actually appears in some uh, form in all four Gospels. And when you see the same story in all four Gospels, that's like a red flag that says, hey, this is going to be on the final. This is really important. And it is. So the story we often hear uh, during Holy Week, um, it's uh, right before Jesus is going to have his last supper with his disciples. And he's in the house of Simon the leper and, uh, in Bethany. Um, and a woman um, comes to, to Jesus and pours perfumed oil on him and washes him from head to foot. And it, it was called alabaster oil. It was very expensive, and she used a lot of it. The disciples yelled at her and said, hey, what are you doing? You can't take that oil and sell it at the market and feed a lot of hungry people, and you're, and you're using it like this. And Jesus then yells at them and says, hey, you dolts, don't you get what's going on? She understands that you don't. And this, the, the reason, it's not that Jesus didn't want to care for the poor, but he knew he only had three years to do whatever he could on earth. And that was coming to an end. And he knew that there's still going to be poor people after I'm gone, but you are meant to take care of them. You meaning the disciples, you meaning us. We're, we're going to take care of them after Jesus is gone, but in the meantime, he knew that he was about to come into his glory through his death and resurrection. The woman who anointed him, washed him with the oil, understood that. The disciples who had been with him all this time didn't get it. They were still quibbling about, no, we got to spend the money on something else. They didn't quite understand it, so Jesus was upset about that. That's why he said that. It, it could have been, it happened to be talking about the poor, it could have been anything else. What he was saying was, you guys are distracted by this other topic when you should be understanding that what I've been telling you all about is about to come to pass. Mm -hmm. And so that's why he said it. But it gets used, it's taken out of context, and it's a big part of um, why we're in kind of an infinite loop of poverty is just inevitable. There's, um, there's, it's the fault of the people who are in poverty, and there's just nothing we can do about it. So we conflate all of these ideas into that kind of whole thing. And we've been doing it for hundreds of years, thousands of years, and we're still kind of in that infinite loop. And it's not because we're bad people, it's just because we're complacent in our belief of what the Bible says to do. But if we look at the economic situation in ancient times, um, and this is super high level, this is me saying, uh, my observation, you can think of ancient peoples having three economic classes. There was the, the very wealthy, that top 10%. They had enough money that they didn't have to worry about anything. They didn't have to worry about next year or kids or their grandkids. They had a lot of money. Then there was the working class. And as that, that was the, um, the artisans, the, um, the tradesmen, the farmers, the people who worked. 
Uh, and as long as they could work, they were able to support their family. And so they worked. And then um, beyond, but below that was that vulnerable class that the prophets were talking about, people who were not able to support themselves with their families. So that's kind of, everybody kind of fit into one of those. That's how the system was. There was no middle class. There was no uh, government aid. Um, the only aid there was was from religious institutions because tithes and offerings were meant to go to help uh, beggars. And begging was, was a thing um, that you were expected to do. If you couldn't work, you could at least beg and you put your tin cup out and, and people would pay you because that's what they were supposed to do. And, and again, that's a, a, a broad blush of how to, how to look at the economic classes of Asian people. But if we fast forward now to modern America, we still have that top 10% that's wealthy, that doesn't have to worry about anything. But now the working class is divided into the middle class and then what I call the working poor. Now, I think all of us are probably part of the middle class. Um, pretty much everybody I know is in that middle class. We can support our families, but we have to do some careful planning. We live pretty comfortably, some people, and that they're there can be a lot of granularity within that middle class, but um, some people can, can live very well. I didn't hear that. If Captain Walsh had to when Captain Green was here, something in the sound system apologized. It's, it's, it's been going on for a while now, yeah. and Steve is wherever. Um, a condenser. So they... Oh, or something, yeah. The middle class can live pretty comfortably. They can go on vacations, they can, you know, they support their family, they can go on vacations, um, maybe buy a boat, maybe have a second home, um, save up for their kids' education, and invest for their own future retirement. Middle class, that's the American dream right there. Um, the middle class is shrinking, we've heard, and it's not because they're moving, some of them are moving up, it's because some of them are moving down. And we learned um, during the recession, the Great Recession, uh, a lot of middle class people who thought they had it made, well, once they got laid off or lost their jobs um, and had they used up their couple of months savings, um, that they lost their homes and they were living out of their Mercedes Benz or whatever because they lost their homes. They had um, nice cars, but they were living. There were a lot of stories about that. We learned last year when we collected money for RIP medical debt that a lot of people are just one bad accident or a serious illness away from falling into financial straits. And that's still, that's, that's the case. Now the working poor are the people who are working hard but they can't, there aren't enough hours in the week for them to work enough hours to support their family without assistance. And so assistance was kind of created for, for them. Um, there's government assistance and there's non-government organizations that have uh, assistance too. Uh, and then there's still that vulnerable class that are unable to work. There's a lot of mental illness. There's a lot of um, other, other reasons people can't work. And so there's also assistance for the program set up for them as well. Um, churches have responded to others with, with mercy. And we've done that ourselves. Cargill has. We've done food pantries and food and clothing giveaways, um, adopt a family at Christmas, uh, collecting school supplies, also volunteering our time. Um, churches are very good at that. And churches have done it, like I said, for, for thousands of years. And we can keep doing it. But as long as we do, nothing's going to change. Because as, long as, as long as we have stuff to give people, they're going to come in and want it because they need it. Because the need is always very great. But sometimes churches emphasize mercy at the expense of justice. And I think that's where we need to jump in. We have to look at justice. It's, it's merciful to feed someone who's hungry. But justice says, why are you hungry? Let's fix that so that we don't have to feed you anymore. It doesn't mean we're not going to feed somebody who's hungry in crisis. Um, but we don't want to keep the, the chronic poverty going if we don't have to. Most of the um, churches that we're talking about, middle class churches, can afford to donate, and we do, either directly or through community-based charities. So people in need can get food, clothing, or whatever that they need. But why do we always have enough, and why do they never have enough? 
Here we are, the haves. Here are the have-nots. It's an inequality, and it causes, um, it, well, it, it, it just continues the, the inequality. As much as we don't want to, and we try not to judge people, it's almost hard not to. Um, you know, here we're opening up the food pantry, and there's a whole line of people just waiting to get their free whatever. And then people sometimes complain, I don't, my kids don't like Jip, they want Skippy, and, you know, that kind of thing. And, and it's, it's an inequality, because the fact is the, the uh, more that you, whenever you give people something that they have the ability to get for themselves, you're taking something from them, you're taking away uh, their agency. You're taking away their um, self-sufficiency. You're taking away their dignity. By, do, by being nice to them, it's not, it's not something we're doing on purpose. We're not doing it to keep them down. We're not oppressing them. It's just the way the system is set up, that's kind of what happens. So if we can answer these questions, why do we always have enough and they never have enough, that's how we're going to solve it. Because the fact is we're never going to lift people out of poverty by giving them stuff. But that's kind of how we've done it. That's the model that we've been using. This is a kind of a um, this is kind of a stark uh, statement here. Charity plays a role in sustaining the structure that creates poverty. And this idea comes from a book that a bunch of us read called Talks of Charity. Charity plays a role in sustaining the structure that creates poverty. We're creating it. We're not. We're not getting rid of it. Um, there are cottage industries set up to help people navigate um, the various benefits that they can get from the government. So somebody opens a business that can help people navigate through the, the benefits. So they're making money because these other people need this help and they can figure out how to help them. It's just, it's just not the way it should be. Um, Argentina a number of years ago, our daughters went to Argentina on Spanish immersion. And we flew into Buenos Aires and then took a shuttle from Buenos Aires to Rosario, Argentina, which is about a four hour tr trip. While we were driving, there were, it, I mean, there's poverty everywhere. When you drive into Rosario, you look like, it looks like you're, you're driving in a bad part of town, but the reality is that's the town. That's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. But in the country, there were these villages that were like tar paper shacks or pieces of metal that somebody found someplace mm -hmm. to put together. They're called vichas or villas. And the government in Argentina pays people to stay there. They give them a stipend to stay in the Visha. It's very troubling and yeah. completely counter to what you're talking about right now. So I want to just uh, define some terms quickly before I get to the, the point of my, my uh, the project. So I think minimum wage, I think everybody knows what minimum wage is. FDR started it in 1938 because um, during the Depression, people were starving to death. Um, there were more workers than there were uh, than there was work, and so employers were taking full advantage and paying as little as humanly possible because they, if you didn't want that job, somebody else would. Um, people were literally dying because of it. Now, it was set at 25 cents an hour based on a 44-hour work week, and over time it rose. It rose with uh, to keep up with the cost of living for about 15 years, and then in the 80s, it didn't. The, the rises, the raises were um, fewer and, and 
parallel between um, when it didn't keep up with the cost of living. And then in 2009, it was $7 and a quarter, which if it was adjusted for 15 years of inflation, would, would have been about $15.10. And, and that's what it still is today. Um, some uh, states and municipalities have increased their own minimum rate, but can't go below what the federal is. California just raised um, theirs to twenty dollars for fast food workers who are working for a, a fast food place that has at least sixty restaurants. I seen on the news yesterday. Yes, Somebody at a mom and pop diner doesn't have to get paid twenty dollars an hour. We've yet to see what's going to come of that. But other states and, uh, and, and municipalities have raised theirs. Uh, the District of Columbia raised theirs at the beginning of the year to $17 an hour, and um, others have, have gone kind of in between there. So it remains to be seen. The hope is um, the, the, the trickle-down theory of economics has been disproven. I think everybody understands that doesn't work. It doesn't trickle down, and certainly when it trickles, it doesn't make it all the way down to the bottom. This is a different theory that says a rising tide lifts all boats. They're, they're both fluid dynamics, so I understand them really well. But, um, when the people who are, who are working make more money, they're going to spend more money, and so the money is going to move up. And it's not going to trickle, it's going to gush. Uh, and so hopefully we'll see that. Of course, the arguments are, well, then we're going to have to raise prices to pay for that, and, or you should take a little bit less of your profit <laughs> and pay for it that way. But uh, we'll see how that comes out. Then there's something called the poverty wage, which um, people hear about, like what's the what's the poverty uh, poverty level where you are? I mean, who's, are you living within your poverty poverty level or are you above it or whatever? And that's just simply uh, a measure that the government started in 1963. President Johnson started it. Uh, well, he came up with uh, declared a war on poverty, and so we had to define poverty, and so it was derived. Um, very simply. I always thought it was a pretty complex algorithm that they used to come up with the poverty line for everywhere. It's, it depends on where you are. It's derived by simply one determinant, and that's the cost of food. And it's found by multiplying the cost of food by three. Because back um, 60 years ago, uh, economists thought that food costs should be about a third of a household's budget. And everything else should be the other two thirds of the budget should cover housing and transportation and clothing and health care and everything else. Um, 60 years on, it's still that. It might as well be arbitrary because it really, there's no reality <laughs> involved in that. However, it's the government standard for poverty and it determines eligibility for government assistance, and non government organizations use it as well. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we were collecting um, over the counter medication for HealthNet, and they gave us a whole bunch of brochures. And in one of their brochures lists their eligibility, and one of them is two and a half times the poverty wage. So they recognize that if you're if you're working at a poverty wage, you're you're not making a lot of money, and even if you're above that poverty wage, you're still not making a lot of money. So twice it, two and a half times it. Uh, RIP medical debt eligibility is four times the, the poverty level. So it might as well just be arbitrary. But it's still used. And then there's a thing called the living wage. And that is the wage um, that's a basic income standard that a full time worker uh, would need to be off of assistance, public or private assistance. It's um, computed with eight determinants. And so in addition to food, there's also housing, health care, uh, transportation, clothing, child care, um, what they call civic engagement, which is like dog licenses and park fees and things like that. And then there's uh, uh, cell phones and broadband internet, um, because these are not luxury anymore, pretty much everybody needs. It provides financial independence, it does not provide any extra. It's not money for vacations or uh, uh, to re repair your car, you need a new refrigerator. It doesn't allow for saving or investing. It's just a basic, very basic uh, wage. And uh, it was it kind of invented by a, a professor at MIT uh, who's been there for 20 years. And she literally sent her graduate assistants to every county in the country 
to, to get the data to, to figure it out with all those determinants. And they figure it out. It depends on the size and the makeup of your family. And there's just a lot that goes into it that I, I wish the poverty would be able to do, but it doesn't. Then there's another term called guaranteed income. This is kind of a generic term um, for a program that um, the government would give a set amount of money directly to recipients on a regular basis. Um, the direct payments would reduce administrative costs of the current welfare systems, the current um, assistance programs. There's no restriction on how the money can be spent. Uh, and there are dozens, right now, dozens of pilot programs going on in the United States because um, groups are doing these pilot programs to demonstrate that this is really the way to go. And they want to demonstrate it. Most of the pilot programs are being funded outside the government. Um, so they want to um, demonstrate to the government that, hey, if we do this, everybody wins. Um, there's a, a, a several different types of guaranteed income programs. The one that a lot of people uh, have heard of is called universal basic income, or UBI. And a lot of times the terms get, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, get confused, or, or this is used generically. A universal basic income is very specific, um, and it, it proposes that the government give every adult citizen uh, or resident a set amount of money on a regular basis. Usually it's monthly, um, and it's between $500 or $1,000. So universal means there's no income or location eligibility. If you're a citizen of that, um, a resident of that town or state or whatever, uh, and you're over 18, you get it. Um, basic means it's enough to meet basic needs. So there's no need for any other kind of assistance programs. And that's how it would get paid for, is, how, is what people think. Um, because if it's a lot, it would get cheaper to just give a set amount of money. There's fewer administrative costs. You don't have to um, keep a lot of records. There's no, they can use it for whatever they want, so you don't have to make sure that they're spending it correctly or anything like that. Uh, it's income because it's a direct payment to the, the adult person in the house. And it's not by household it's by If there are four adults living together, they all get it. So then the other kind of guaranteed income programs are targeted. And these are ba basically targeted to recipients in, in various different, either economic classes, uh, racial, they can be, it can be anything. There's one that I wonder whether that they did, they completed it in uh, one of the Carolinas for formerly uh, incarcerated people. And the mayor of the town said he got a whole bunch of people who objected to it and said, why are we giving these guys money? They broke the law, they're a bunch of convicts. And he said, you know what, we're going to have to take one one way or the other. If we don't help them now, they're going to have, they're not going to be able to get jobs, they're not going to be able to, to get their life back together. Um, and so they're going to reoffend and they're going to end up back in prison and then we're going to pay for everything for them. And that's going to cost a lot of money. If we help them out, we can give them job training, or they can use the money to get job training, to get better jobs, um, to, to have a better life, and that theoretically they won't reoffend and, and we won't have to pay for them at, at the same level. Well, they did that and they had a 0% recidivism rate. Every single person in that, in that program, and I don't remember what the number was, but every single one of them was able to move into a permanent job uh, and get their life together. And move on. There are programs for um, single mothers. There are programs for uh, targeted at um, people of color or, or whatever. There are a lot. Of, most of them are based on income. Um, and it's not to supplement. It's not basic income. It's meant to supplement but not replace earned income. So it doesn't disincentivize them from, from getting a job or, or keeping a job. It might, however, uh, it released the pressure on them, so it might allow them to get rid of maybe one of their two or three part-time jobs that they have because they think they need that to get by. Um, it might allow them to go to school, go back to school and get uh, a degree, get a better job. Um, there are an awful lot, and so I've, uh, I had a lot of, um, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of data on the results of some of these pilot programs. So if we look at Rock County, um, for a family, I just made up a, 
uh, an average family of two adults who are both working and two kids. The poverty wage is six dollars and sixty-seven cents an hour. And again, that's based only on the cost of food. That's assuming both adults are working full time at that wage. If only one adult is working, they have to make twice the amount. So thirteen dollars and thirty-four cents uh, is enough to keep a family of two adults and two kids out of poverty, supposedly. A living wage for Rock County for that same family of two adults and two kids, $24.70 an hour, again, assuming both of those adults are working full time at that rate. If not, if only one is working, they only have to make $37 an hour because the other adult, and remember there's those eight determinants, and that other adult is home, so they might not need child care. They, the second adult doesn't need transportation to get to work. They don't need work clothes. Um, so it's, uh, they have the one, one adult working full time doesn't have to make twice what both of them make. Uh, and then guaranteed income. Most of the pilot studies that I've read give between $500 and $1,000 a month. I chose $1,000, which would come to $5.77 an hour. So for that family with two adults, that's an additional $2,000 a month. I'd just like to add one thing. is The thirty-six ninety-seven for uh -huh. if only one adult is working? Yeah. Well, the union, the laborers' union starting wage is about $39 now. Is it? But that's because it's the laborers' union. Because it's the union. Yep. And that's about seventy. This is about seventy-six thousand a year. Yes. Yeah. And the poverty wage mm -hmm. is twenty-seven thousand. Four. Yeah. Unbelievable. So if you're, you're making, and then and part of the problem too with the system is let's you know you take a single mom with a couple kids or a the family and two adults mm -hmm. making thirteen whatever an hour. Um, at, at the poverty wage, well, let's say they work a little harder, they get some more hours, and they make a little bit more. Now they're not in poverty anymore, so they lose a lot of, uh, or some of that um, financial aid, the, the um, welfare type programs that, they, that they're um, eligible for when they're in poverty. So if they work harder, they lose, and they often, the amount of aid that they lose is often a lot more than the amount of additional income they get. So, why would they want to work? And it's a, it's a cycle, it's an endless cycle um, of people who would, it's not that they don't want to work more or work harder, um, but that results in them not, not having as much money for their families. Um, the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, is where I got this, this table. It's for Rock County, um, but not rural. It's um, metropolitan Janesville and Malloy. Uh, it's by occupational area from 2022, starting with management 